So over the course of this semester, I have reviewed just about every single lecture that Dr. Clavo Hall has given during both the spring 18 as well as the spring 2019 semesters. And I have to be honest and say that this particular recording that is used for the basis of this lecture was one of the ones where the students were most engaged in terms of interjecting into Dr. Clavo Hall's lecture. And while those interjections were often related to what was being discussed, they were also somewhat tangential as well. And because of that, you'll notice that the amount of content that actually is focused upon Dr. Clavel Hall in this lecture is only about 15 minutes, even though the recording that it came from was just over an hour. So one of the things that will happen as a part of this particular lecture is that about halfway through when they get a bit sidetracked but the content starts to turn towards a direction that allows Dr. Clavel Hall to skip a bunch of slides, I'm going to pause her class at that point and come in and discuss these slides that she's skipping over and then we'll rejoin her class where they picked up the slide deck at that point in time. So at this point, I will turn it over to Dr. Clavo Hall to get us started. So now let's look a little bit at our, uh, at our, some of our reading for tonight. And looking at this point, I'm thinking about, what did you think of, uh, offhand before you started getting into your reading? Did you know much about just dissemination of evidence what do you what did you think about dissemination of evidence what's that about so the two things that i heard in all of your responses there's two different areas with nikki and jeremy and half of molly sorry molly mm -hmm. uh that i'm hearing dissemination is about how you uh get your implementation done the proximity of doing the intervention and that's a part of dissemination. How do I get it to the, the target people that, I, that the program was meant for, is what I'm hearing. That's the second part. And I heard some of that from Molly and, and John, half, half of Molly, Sharon, John, and now I'm going to include Jeremy in that half, in that the second part of that is, once it's done, how do you get it out there like the iPhone? How do I actually disseminate the results of after having implemented it and get the final results out? What I'm saying to the group of all of you is you're all correct in that dissemination happens at more than one phase. It happens at your phase of, I have this implementation and I've got to get it to the people involved in it, the stakeholders, the patients, whoever. And when we finish the implementation and decided, deciding we're going to tweak it a little and what we do next, we eventually have to get it out to a broader audience because that's what EBP is about. That's what research is about. That's it would do you no good just to keep it at the target audience. Even though you did some dissemination, when does it get beyond that to have the public health impact, which is looking at T4, T3, okay? That's how we get out. So realize dissemination has at least two important phases that it occurs at. Does that make sense? So it's not, uh, I think I like what Molly's saying, it's not just a simple, just disseminating uh, the implementation and starting the project. If you stop there, how much translational research would ever occur. And that's what it's about, passing it along. And the cycle keeps going and that's how we grow. Either you prove what you, uh, build on what you did by proving that it works or build on what you did to say it doesn't work with this population the way it worked with that one. That's knowledge. Some people are concerned. I did my project and what I thought was gonna happen didn't happen. So you're trying to change it to make it, no. You're not trying to write, you're not trying to create the story. You're just writing the story, okay? okay. All of it is building knowledge, so it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's more important that you report what actually happened than try and make it look pretty or make you look perfect. 
And that's the iterative process. If you only had to do it one time and forget about it, most of you wouldn't even be here today. I probably wouldn't even be here today, okay? So it's about doing it to make it better for the people who need it, okay? So that's dissemination of evidence happening at more than two places. So we're looking at a couple of things tonight, looking at synthesizing the issues of dissemination, and we're gonna look at a few models. And when we talk about dissemination, we talked, as we talked about, it's about communicating, um, communication of the clinical research and the theoretical findings for the purposes of transitioning the new knowledge to the point of care. And what we're finding is those points of care can be a variety of geographic places, a variety of populations of people of different levels. And the process that you're learning here is how do I customize that intervention for this new group of people or this setting that has fewer resources than prior settings that I may have used. Um, and so it would be nice if everybody were fully resourced and everybody was fully compliant with our healthcare recommendations. But the last time I heard, the real world did not operate like that. So we're looking at some of the challenges of dissemination. And in some places, we're going to see it as challenges to DNI, because as you just pointed out, dissemination occurs with implementation as well as at the far end. And there's been a number of, and we've talked about some of this before, a number of non-healthcare fields that have informed DNI. And it's interesting. Uh, we, we see here agriculture, education, and marketing. Did you realize that, uh, what is it, um, Rogers? Is it uh, dissemination of innovation? Diffusion of, in, diffusion of uh, innovation, okay? Uh, and that is a major framework that we use. Uh, that's where we came. That's where we came with the, uh, the early adopters the late adopters, the innovators, and the laggards. Have you heard of those before? Yes. So Rogers was actually a farmer and worked in agriculture and worked on his PhD, using, looking at some of the agricultural chemicals that he was using and how to spread what he was doing that was helpful in one small uh, agricultural community and how to get that positive response and action by spreading the good work he was doing in the small community to other communities. And he began to write about it when he was doing his PhD in an agricultural field. Have you heard that story before? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we rely on diffusion of innovation a lot in science and it came from agriculture. And like this is pointing out, look at these different areas of education, marketing, uh, com communication. Don't be afraid to reach out beyond healthcare. Don't be afraid to, okay. You may find that you're a diamond in the rough as long as you're staying in healthcare or close to healthcare, you may have to venture out other places. So I only say, don't limit your possibilities of where you would seek collaboration and help or offer it, okay? Open your world, make global health your own mission to work with those that are willing to work with the project and the values that you work with. Okay, so often we think, I've been at Sutter for 25 years, where else would I go, you know? There's lots of places you can go, but it may not be easy to let go, okay? So open your possibility. And that's a part of what getting back to dissemination is that other professions, I'm thinking medicine and even pharmacy are growing to be uh, looked at in a more pro medical profession has always been, no matter, I mean, you can have a physician as dumb as a doorknob, but with a, a doctor behind their name, people are going to give them a certain level of respect. For nurses, you can be as smart as Einstein, but they don't have MD behind their name, and they will be not be as widely appreciated and acknowledged for their, uh, for their skills. 
and with pharmacy and pharmacists beginning to <clears throat> elevate their pop their uh their profession educationally, educationally and with the skills that they're using some of them even overlapping into nursing uh they're elevate becoming elevated within the medical profession so nursing <clears throat> As we are looking here, I'm going to change to it right now. When we talk about nursing, we actually oftentimes remember nursing was based on this is how we've always done it. So as you've probably noted over the last couple of minutes, there seems to have been a bit of choppiness in the recording. And the reason for that is because the students have really engaged in some of these topics, particularly around the issues of both the different partners that are involved in the process of conducting translational research and the willingness of some of those partners to become involved in that process along with the reality that some of these additional partners, because of their training and their background and the types of thinkers and theorists and frameworks and models that they are exposed to, would actually not only be able to contribute to this translational research, but would actually go a long way in improving the quality of the translational research that's being done. So those are the topics that the students really started to engage with. And again, while their interjections were somewhat related to the topics that Dr. Clavel Hall was discussing, they were also tangential in many respects, which allowed her, forced her to deviate from these slides. And in the actual recording, she goes through these next three slides just by click, 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 click to get to the one that will pick up her recording on again. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about these three slides and it actually underscores some of the issues that Dr. Clavel Hall was talking about. So in the previous lecture, the lecture for chapter 23, we had focused upon the idea of implementation research. And one of the things that we learned about implementation research was the fact that there is a lot more implementation research and it's a lot more developed as a field than what dissemination research is. And one of the reasons that we pointed to for that was the fact that when it comes to dissemination research that the lack of consistency around the terminology that existed was one of the major factors in that. And if you can look at the, particularly the first two points, the first two bullets on this particular slide, the studies by Graham et al. and the study by Cole Kuhun et al. that you see there, both of these studies underscore the problematic nature of the fact that you've got multiple terms that are being used with respect to dissemination research and that hinders its ability to be effective as a tool for translational research. So that really underscores the importance of coming up with specific strategies as a part of our planning when we are looking at conducting translational research. So as you are looking through, particularly the white chapter 18 reading, the things that are being outlined in there you want to keep in mind as you are thinking about how you might disseminate your research. And not just in terms of what are the requirements of the DNP project so that I can finish that project and get my diploma or get my degree and, and um, potentially apply the things that I'm learning in the program. But how can I do this? Not that those things aren't important, but how can I do this in a way that it's going to make it more meaningful so that the things that I'm spending all of this time on are actually going to have some sort of meaningful impact upon the specific context in which I'm working in. So as you look at those types of things, you know, one of the things that you should come back to, and this is one of the things that will help with the dissemination, because one of the reasons why we disseminate 
is so that others can benefit or learn from the things that we have done. And that's why in the course we've always continued to come back to this idea of the role of existing theories, frameworks, and models, and how you use those in your particular project and the importance of those in your particular project. And really underscoring the fact that we aren't just talking about these because this is an advanced degree and we want you to have some understanding of the theoretical underpinnings of the field and of the discipline and of the way in which research works. It's because they allow you to construct a particular project to undertake that project and then to disseminate that project in a way in which it should have a greater impact than if you were to just do it in sort of a haphazard unsystematic process. And it's at this point where um, in terms of the slide deck we actually move back into the slides that Dr. Clavel Hall uh, was discussing and get to the specific one that she uh, landed on as a part of the conversation that the students were having. So we'll pick up her recording again at this stage and then I'll jump in again at the end. And back to dissemination and nursing and you as doctoral students looking at the importance of <coughs> disseminating your work because that's what helps to elevate our profession and you as a professional Get, getting it out there and uh, making people uh, understand that nursing is more than a task-oriented profession. It's more than about making you comfortable. Yes, I want to make sure you're comfortable. Yes, I want to make sure that you're satisfied. But there's a level of professionalism that you adhere to as well being members of your uh, professional organizations or taking leadership roles in other areas if you choose not to be make it all nursing it's okay but my point is you are leaders now and leaders are beyond just the task the task is a part of it we all have to pay bills and do our job but know that you're leading change that's what your projects are about. And being able to lead change is disseminating what you do and being a part of uh, getting it out there to people who need it. And so this is what we're looking at as leaders in nursing. Again, when we talk about taking our work out, we have to take it out as a whole person. Don't get so stuck on, <laughs> I've seen like, in nurse anesthesia, I've seen it where people, actual nurse anesthetists begin to work with a group of anesthesiologists or a particular specialty, and they even rise above the other nurse anesthetists. You know, I'm a mini dentist now. I'm a mini neurosurgeon. I'm, it's like you're a nurse anesthetist. Well, you, you, you forgot about that. It's like you forget who you are until one of them reminds you. You're only a nurse. So uh, we have to continue to thrive and, and look at trying to be leaders in using evidence-based practice. We used in, uh, during this time, we've talked about different frameworks that we, frameworks and theories that we've used, like the re-aim, the proceed, pre-seed, pre proceed, the, uh, what is it, knowledge translation. L looking at these things, Start thinking about when you approach problems, what kind of framework might help you explain that problem better? What about uh, Bandura's, what is it? Uh, <laughs> what is it, process, uh, uh, what is it, uh, process outcome? Practice process outcome, there's three steps to it. Think about, when you think about problems, can I frame it in an established theory or an established model? Just play in your mind, put things on paper. Can I possibly explain it? Can I explain this with Roger's diffusion of innovation? 
can I look at this? Look at this slide that we're going to... And even when we're talking about looking at using the different frameworks and models that we've talked about, it's interesting that even at the highest level of research, these are looking at R01 types of NIH type grants. Look at some of the models and, and theories they're looking at. Look at the percentage that use Rogers uh, Diffusion of Innovation plus re-aim. This is something, does your project or does your approach need to include more than one theory or uh, framework? Uh, look at re-aim, using it alone, 7%. And some of the other minor types of theories and models that we've looked at. Look at the bottom line. What does it say? No, no theory, theory or framework. The <laughs> this and the largest. This is what can distinguish you when you start thinking along these type lines, and a lot of other people may not be. <laughs> this is what establishes you as a leader that I'm able to explain this problem based on re-aim. And this is how it would fit. And re-aim was not created by Nike. It was an official model concept. Here is the article on the, on the model that we're going to use. This is how you establish yourself as a leader in nursing. When people start seeing, when you talk, it's based on evidence, it's based on studies, it's based on established models, it's based on validated tools. When you start talking about, oh, I, I think we're going to use this because Rogers in 2014 showed that this worked in a similar situation. When you start thinking about that as the way to talk about your professional conversation, people begin to look at you differently. And looking at the chart and how many people don't use models and frameworks, this is one little niche area where you can begin to establish yourself as an evidence-based person. And it'll start out with, oh, you're just a little different. But in, in time, it's, you know what you're talking about. And that begins to separate you and move you up. And so as you embrace this and make it a part of your thinking and your process of how you do things, you're slowly but surely building your own foundation as a professional and separating yourself in a way that other people may not understand, but it works for you. And with your productivity will be based on things that are objective, that CFOs and CEOs can understand and appreciate okay so now it's not about being just the best nurse i can be we have plenty of damn good nurses we've got to be the best nurse in your area and above to be able to move it with your skill set which is what you're learning here skill set cognitive and experiential is what you're doing okay i have to say you didn't let me get through the first 10 slides Okay. As has been Dr. Clavohall's practice at that point when she finished up her lecture and the students went on break before they came back to work on a group project that they were working on, um, there were a couple of slides that were left over at the end, mainly just the summary slide, but a couple of things that I did want to mention. The first is that when you look at the levels of dissemination, and this is really coming more from the White uh, et al. Chapter 18, reading. There are three levels that you want to consider. You know, the specific context where you are undertaking the translational research, so that specific setting, your site, if you will, is your level one. The institutional organization under which that specific setting is located would be level two. And then how can you get that information, the things that you've learned from that research that you've done, that translational research that you've done, out beyond the individual institutional organization that you are looking at. So in this case, they say level three would be national or international, but I would just say that it is external to the specific context in which you are working. 
And there's a number of, I guess, typical strategies that we often see students at the DNP level undertaking. And the poster is probably the most common one. Um, oftentimes we'll see presentations uh, both at the at the institutional or organizational level, but in some cases at practitioner-focused conferences and professional development sessions. Uh, there is a scatter student that will go through the effort of trying to publish what it is that they've learned. In some cases, those publications are actually in a more research-focused, peer-reviewed journal. But in most cases, they tend to be in more practitioner-oriented uh, focused or practitioner focused publications so but those are three common options that you see they're not the only three that you could use as an example you could actually go and create an instructional video based upon the things that you learned as a part of your translational research both in terms of the intervention but also in terms of the process and then upload that video to YouTube so that other people could search for it and find it when they were searching for these kinds of things in much the same way that you were searching for information about your particular topics so that's just another example of something that you could do that goes beyond these sort of standard dissemination models but really what dissemination sort of boils down to is essentially how do you communicate the things that you have learned both about what it was that you did and also about how it was that you went about doing it to people that would be interested in that information in most cases the folks that are going to be interested in that information so the audience that you're trying to reach is probably going to be fairly local to you. They're going to be somehow connected in a direct way with your specific context. So as you start thinking about how you might disseminate this or the ways in which you might disseminate this, because while the pro program itself, so the dissertation project, only requires that you disseminate it in one way, there's nothing that's stopping you from disseminating it in multiple venues and multiple methods. So as you're thinking about how to go about disseminating the things that you learn from your translational research project, what you want to do is make sure that you consider who you're trying to reach and then how is the best way in which I can reach them. So who's my audience or who's my audience for this particular message and then what's the best way to reach this particular audience. So in summary, one of the things that we want to take away from the readings this week, and this actually touches on some of the information that's in Chapter 28 in the Bronson et al. textbook, but this seven-year odyssey that we've been talking about from when we actually learn something from a research-based perspective in that, that T1 type range to when it actually is being used in practice on a large scale, this 17-year odyssey, it's much greater than 17 years when we look at low and moderate income countries. So while it's 17 years in places like Canada and the United States and Western Europe, when we look at those who are in need of health care the most, in many cases the, the timeline for those translational research efforts is much longer than 17 years and while the textbook focuses upon low and moderate income countries I would argue that it's just low and moderate income geographies because let's face it if you are living in an area that is middle class or upper middle class and the public services that you have around you are reflective of those kinds of environment that also means that the people in those areas are also reflective of that kind of environment whereas if you're living in podunk United States of America and the they have great difficulty in attracting and retaining medical professionals, qualified nurse practitioners, so that oftentimes p the positions are being filled by people that either don't have the proper qualifications for the position but are sort of placeholders until they can find somebody for it, but because it's an unattractive location 
that oftentimes they never do find someone more appropriate for it or somebody who does have the training experience for the position but has no practical experience so they're just fresh out of school and they don't have all of those lived experiences that you would have uh, if you had been practicing for years and years and in many cases as individuals gain that experience and start to become veteran medical professionals that's often when they use that expertise that they've gained from that experience to leverage it into a position that's located in a more desirable geographic area. So this idea that you know the 17-year odyssey is much greater for not just lower and moderate income countries, but I would say lower and moderate income regions, regardless of the country that it exists in. So there are a lot of rural areas, poor areas throughout the United States where that 17-year odyssey is much greater than what it would be for the more urbanized and industrialized areas of the country. The other thing to underscore here, and again, this is focusing more upon chapter 28 in the Bronson et al. textbook, is when we look at the lessons that we learn from translational research and the ability to conduct implementation research and then to disseminate the lessons that we get from the research that's being done, that, that practitioner-based research that's being done. Well, all of the things that we do here in Northern California in these more modern and robust and in theory better resourced hospitals, they are struggling with the exact same challenges that we're facing here in every single country around the world. And unfortunately, in many of those jurisdictions, they don't have the resources that we have here to be able to undertake some of the translational research that we do. And this is one of the reasons why dissemination becomes so important. It is pointless to do research without having that dissemination step built into it. So if you're going to undertake translational research, if you don't tell anybody about it, if you don't use this as an opportunity to improve the things that are happening on your unit, in your hospital, on your floor, within your organization or institution, et cetera, et cetera, um, really it's just a wasted effort. And that's why um, I think when you look at the White et al. textbook in particular, they spend a full chapter just basically talking about this is how you can get the word out. And it seems like an odd thing, in all honesty, to have in a book that's all about how to do translational research. But I think that speaks to how important a step it is in the overall process of translational research. So that's it for this particular lecture. 